Sarah, uh, the question of evolution and theology us usually is done in an adversarial way, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the, uh, in the U.S. In, in, in recent years. I've never paid a lot of attention to the arguments uh, on, on those sides. It's, it's not terribly significant. I was really intrigued because in your Gifford lectures, uh, you uh, took a very positive approach to evolution and theology in terms of cooperation and kind of looking at it from a, a much more sophisticated way. And I, I want to try to understand that, uh, uh, the approach that you've had. Well, let's try, first of all, to rule out what I'm not saying, because it's very hard for people to hear this correctly. So I'm not saying that there's something about evolutionary processes and evolutionary science that is intrinsically atheistic um, and naturalistic. Um, I'm not saying either, which is often how theologians respond to that challenge, that science deals with mere facts and theologians can come along and add any kind of veneer of interpretation that they like. That, that's what I call naive correlationism. This mm. is to be avoided. No, what I want to do is something much more sophisticated that has to bring philosophy and philosophy of science into the mix right from the start. Because first of all, we have to look at what evolutionary science is actually now teaching. And in my Gifford lectures, I focus specifically on this very interesting and strange phenomenon within evolution, which is the phenomenon of cooperation in a technical sense, which runs right through the spectrum of life. That there are behaviors in evolution that involve um, costly, costly undertakings by individual entities or by populations or uh, groups within populations, which nonetheless endure because ultimately they are for the good of the larger whole. Um, it is, of course, uh, distractingly um, suggestive already to call those sacrificial behaviors. So let's bracket that for the moment and just focus on the lean notion of cooperation. Now, once you start to talk about cooperation in evolutionary science, you are in the middle of an immediate argument of the most important form. What is the meaning of cooperation in evolution as a whole? Science comes front-loaded with its own hermeneutics of what mm -hmm. this meaning might be. And that, in the last few years, there's been an enormous discussion about whether cooperation when we find it in evolution, which we do everywhere, is simply to be explained or explained away as a phenomenon that has evolved actually for the sake of genetic continuity. So according to um, Hamilton's rule, which is one way of um, explicating this mathematically, this phenomenon works to the extent that it furthers the good, not of my direct descendants, which I have not had in this case, but my uh, nephews and nieces, for instance. Now, if this is a the case, then it's not particularly interesting in a way. Um, it is simply another form of evolution behaving as it does in order that life is sustained. However, in the debate that's going on at the moment, philosophical issues are at stake. <laughs> because it is not absolutely clear that that's the end of the story where cooperation is concerned. Cooperation even seems to work in cases where there are groups that do not involve genetic um, inheritance or immediate genetic uh, goods. Um, these are the really interesting test cases about which Darwin himself actually had a premonition in The Descent of Man. And when you think that this phenomenon of costly behavior, which is nonetheless positive, um, runs right through the spectrum of life. It's natural, I think, to begin to wonder what you want to make of it in terms of um, philosophical explanation. So can you make a, a, a leap from that to some sort of a, of a purpose beyond the obvious purpose of whether it's the individual gene or the, the family or the species. I mean, the, the locus of the survival of the fit, that, that's, yeah. a, that's a, an argument within evolutionary theory. Uh, but no matter where you go there, um, I, I'm, how do you go from a kind of an optimization of, yeah. whatever, of whatever level you're optimizing 
to a deeper purpose? Well, here's where the controversial stuff comes in. And I think you have to beware again. Don't imagine that there's going to be a major leap here no, um, immediately to some kind of uh, hmm. reintroduction of the idea of teleology as someone like Paley thought of it. No, I think it's, it's much more demanding than that. One has to look, first of all, at the micro level and ask, well, why is it that um, in the uh, great periods of transition in evolutionary life, cooperation seems to have been peculiarly important just at the moment of breakthrough into a higher level? That's in itself interesting, because you're then not just looking at sort of individual um, species, but you're looking at the bigger picture of how breakthroughs in life's potentiality occurred. And then if you start to look at individual species again and raise once again, which is, goes against the grain of much evolutionary theory, of what the, as it were, the purpose of cooperative behaviors mm, are, mm. Many people in biology would say, oh, you've overstepped the mark there. We don't do teleology, we only do teleonomy. <laughs> um, but uh, the fact is, as you go up the, um, the complexity of life and you reach some of the higher mammals, you see manifestations of cooperation which are really striking and difficult to um, explain simply on reductive genetic grounds, e.g., such behaviors as um, porpoises and dolphins um, helping each other in conditions of assault, even when there is actually no hope of um, mm -hmm. one of their brethren, if you like, mm -hmm. being able to survive, or um, uh, uh, circling around a stricken creature in order to um, support and sustain it. And you think, well, how have these behaviors survived, and are these actually manifestations of some kind of purposive life. Um, and philosophers have thought a lot about this in higher mammals um, as being, in some sense, already rational, as in some sense already um, suggesting some kind of um, preparation for ethical behavior. And so the, I, I, what I'm trying to do is to see if you follow the line of thinking, which, which I can do, mm. what is that result that you're getting, getting to? to. What, what, what's, the, what's the ideal case? Maybe we won't get there, but I want, I want to know what, the, what, the, what the, the potentiality of the end goal is. Right. What I'm suggesting is that it is not a false move to observe these different levels of cooperative behavior and the deeper sophistication coming out in them, and to ask the really big question, which usually individual evolutionary biologists will not ask. Mm. It has been very um, unfashionable to do so. What is the meaning of this in toto? What does it suggest? And what does it suggest for human life? Mm. And once you get to that point, you are on the edge of being able to construct some kind of suggestive teleological ethical argument for uh, design within this evolutionary process. Now, that's not going to be a knockdown argument that will persuade anyone of the sense of God de novo on its own. But it's a suggestion, which then I think and argue has to be met by some kind of transformation in epistemically in the self to add up to an argument for God's existence. So there's, there are the evidences, uh, then there are um, the kind of um, suggestibilities here that without irrationality, I think, may cause us to think afresh about whether this whole spectrum of evolutionary behaviors has some deeper teleology within it.